Hallelujah. I want you to go with me to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Can y'all praise God for this music ministry as a whole? You guys are incredible. What I want to preach about today could change your life if you let it. Somebody say this, it could change my life if I let it. This is one of the most rehearsed verses in the scripture. Uh, but John, it's not the most studied. A lot of people will know it, but I want to dive into it and I want to take some phrases from just one verse that will change your life if you let it. It's Galatians chapter 6. Verse number nine. You heard it. Let's find out what it means. And let us not be weary. Or in, if you know it, the way they taught us in church. And be not weary. In well doing. For in due season you will reap a harvest you shall reap a harvest if somebody say if if you faint not how many of y'all know it's about time you get your harvest i mean you've been wishing hoping praying fasting being humble, taking the low road, taking the back seat for your harvest. If I'm talking to you, say you're talking to me. Can you do me a favor? I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know this is our first date. But God told me to tell you something. And I hope it don't scare you. I'm due. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Everybody shout, I'm due. So recently, I had the opportunity to go to Accra, Ghana on the Gold Coast to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the honor of my life to get to preach the gospel for you. But it is special when people call you across the water to preach the gospel, they have an entirely different culture than me. They speak different languages than I do. And somehow God entrusted me with the gift that they would summon me to another continent to share the gospel of Jesus. And it may not mean anything to you, but I know people who they don't want to hear in the city they live in, let alone somebody ask you to come across the water to share the gospel. It's amazing to me. I grew up in the, I guess what you would call the hood, the projects. Nobody in our hood was talking about going to Africa. We were just talking about living to get out of high school. We were not talking about having global ministry. We were talking about not being teenage fathers. The goal for us was not to get shot. That's it. And to have given my life to Jesus and to have preached from everywhere, from Australia to South Africa, meaning Cape Town and both Johannesburg, to Lagos, Nigeria, Abuja, Accra, London, France, Paris, and 42 out of the 50 states. I find myself sometimes in awe that God would use me to do something that amazing. 
I, I say all of that to say because sometimes you need to sit down long enough to see all he's done for you. You'll think that somebody else's life is better and their life will be better if that's the life you're thinking about. But if you just settle down and see how many days you went and didn't have to be hungry. I mean, just sit down and think about how many times you went to the gas station and the pump was working. Just think about it. Just think about, you may not have everything you want, but you got, you got a lot of, lot of things that you didn't deserve. Am I talking to anybody in here today? When I went over to Africa, I was looking at, in some cases, and, and the media would have you to believe that all of Africa is impoverished. Nothing is further from the truth. There are people in Africa that make you and I look poor. And let me tell you something else that's another caveat. We have banks that we get loans from, which means that even though you live in a house, don't mean you can afford it. If they live in a house over there, it's because they bought it because they don't have credit systems. They have to build their houses with cash. They have to buy their cars with cash. So in some way, their wealth is paramount to ours. Because for most of us in here, you got a nice car, but you're paying $9,000 a month for it. <laughs> you, you got a nice apartment, but your rent is $2,250 for 200 square feet. <laughs> she said, where they live at? <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. You're overpaying for where you live. You're paying too much to hear somebody stumping above your head all day. You're paying too much to hear somebody baby crying all night long. So I got to Africa and I thought, man, in some places, I was feeling sorry for them. And one time I, we rode past a building and I saw a building being painted. Uh, that they were just building, and outside of it, they had scaffolding. Uh, if you know what scaffolding is, for those of you all who are builders, it's, it's this um, idea that I thought was going to be clearer when they put it up. Uh, but it's this idea of, you, you know, you go past a building and you see these metal steps that the guys are walking on, and they're painting. It's called scaffolding, and they build it up on the building so that way they can refurbish it or repaint it or whatever they're doing on the scaffolding. And when we got to Ghana, the scaffolding was made out of bamboo. And I'm driving, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, we're in the car. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I feel so sorry for them. They're having to build scaffolding, and, and, and they're doing it out of bamboo, and their, their lives are in danger only to recognize that bamboo is stronger than concrete. I began to ask the people about what was going on and why they were using this bamboo. They were literally walking on bamboo, balancing on bamboo. And I'm thinking, oh, the whole thing is about to come crashing down. And I asked one of the attendants, he said, oh, no, you, you got to understand there is something. Here it is. I'm preaching called comprehensive strength and comprehensive strength is the strength that a material has that prevents it from breaking or being crushed and he went on to say to me I don't know if you Americans know it he said but bamboo has a stronger comprehensive strength than your bricks and your concrete I wondered how many people you feel sorry for that are stronger than you? I wonder how many times have you looked at somebody's circumstance and said, oh, I feel sorry for them because they don't have this and they don't have that. Is it possible but their strength is built out of what they don't have? Sometimes strength is not the result of what I do have. Sometimes strength is learning the strength of what I have in my possession. He said, this is, this, is, this is comprehensive strength. Then he said, oh, also, also, bamboo doesn't just have comprehensive strength. He said it has flexural strength. I said, what is flexural strength? He said, flexural strength is the ability of the bamboo to bend without breaking. 
He said, this, this bamboo can bend. He said, and you got all kinds of things in your home and your garage that's made out of bamboo. He said, your, your fishing rods are made out of bamboo. Look at how they bend, but don't break. Look at how you have floors that are made out of bamboo. He said, uh, cutting boards where you cut food on. He said, look at all of these things that bamboo is made of, and it is one of our resources, and we have learned how to manufacture some of the most amazing things in our country out of this material. He said, again, fishing rods. He said uh, floors. He said tables, cutting boards. And even when you go uh, to other countries uh, in, in tropical places, they build huts out of bamboo. He started to talk about how they use this as a natural material. And then I started to think about this. And he says, many of the things that we know that have beauty are made of bamboo. And then we always talk about how great the bamboo is, but we never talk about, I'm ready to preach, its journey on how it gets there. I looked at the scaffolding, but I didn't know the journey. We look at the cutting board, but we don't know the journey. I'm getting ready to tell you something because the Chinese bamboo tree in particular, listen to me, can be buried in the ground for seven years without growing. That bamboo is in the ground five to seven years and it shows no hint of growth. Yeah, it shows no sign of getting better. Y'all gonna get me in a minute. It, it Five to seven years of looking in the ground and watering it and nothing growing. Five to seven years of humility, but no humility in return. Five to seven years of I'm sorry, but never getting an I'm sorry back. Five to seven years of sacrifice. All I'm saying is somebody in the house feels like bamboo that you have given year after year after year after year after a year to the process only to be here five to seven years and have nothing to show for it. And let me tell you something, bamboo takes at least three years before it starts getting roots and you have to water it once a week, every week for two years without missing. If you water bamboo every week for one year and miss a week, the process of the seed starts back over and you then have to go back to watering it once a week again for two years. So whatever part you stop, that bamboo resets itself. Oh, I'm preaching. Y'all ain't getting it yet. It resets itself. That means you could be watering it every day, every day, every day, every day. But one day you had an attitude and didn't water it. Got to start all the way over. From the beginning, I watered it. God, I watered it for a year and nine months. God, I watered it for a year and 10 months. But the problem is, is the process acts for 24 months. And when you stop in the process, you have to start over. And I just wanted to know before I preach today, how many bamboo Christians are in the room and online that didn't recognize because you quit too quick, you had to start over. And it wasn't the seed, it was the waterer. It wasn't the seed, it was the process. And how many of us in here are like the bamboo? God, I've been at this for three years and I see no progress. I, I've been in school for three years and, and I still don't know if I'm going to make it. I've been on this job for three years and they still haven't given me a raise. I've been, I've been here all of this time and nothing has happened. But here's what you need to know about bamboo and then I'm going to get into the sermon. After the fifth to the seventh year of watering it every week for two to three years, guess what? Then it grows three and a half inches a day. Oh, I'm preaching. Some of y'all sleep, but you're going to get it when, I, when you wake up. Three and a half inches a day, 90 feet in five years. Can you imagine? No response in the first year. No miracle in the second year. No breakthrough in the third year. God didn't do nothing in 2021. Nothing happened at that service. Nothing happened at that revival. Nothing happened reading that book. Nothing happened listening to that podcast. Nothing happened or so you thought. But what you didn't know is that beneath the dirt, God was matriculating a process that was going to get you to the place where you were going to have three and a half inches of growth per day. And I don't know who I'm talking to. But I am talking to somebody in the room who will just be patient enough to know that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And I speak a season of multiplication in your life that if you have been waiting for a long time, you better get ready for exponential growth. Somebody shout is getting ready to grow for me. 
What if you have been broke for the last five years only for your money to triple three and a half times every year? I receive it too. But the problem is, is that most of us despise dirt time. Oh, preach, Keon. I think I will. We, we love grow time. We love sprout time. We love flossing time. We love showing everybody what God did. But what do you do when God is doing something, but you just can't see it? How many of y'all in here right now? Am I I'm on your, your front porch ringing your doorbell right now? I'm knocking at your door. You are like the bamboo. It's happening. It's growing. It's flourishing. It's about to happen, but you got to stay with the process. You can't get an attitude when it don't work. You can't stop coming to church when you didn't get the miracle. You can't stop praying just because you don't feel like it. You got to keep going and going and going. And all of a sudden you will wake up and it'll be three and a half inches, six, seven, 10, 15, $5 raise, $10 raise, $800 raise, $5,000 raise, $100,000 multiplication. And there is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he can do for you. So I need all the blessed people to shout in here. The reason why I had the blessed people to shout is so the broke people could get some confidence and know that if God is blessing your neighbor, it means he's in the neighborhood. So do me a favor. Just look down your road. If you see anybody that look blessed, you ought to start shouting. Because if they look blessed, it means God is in the neighborhood. Just look down your road. Matter of fact, interview them. Have you been blessed lately? If they say, yeah, you better start shouting because God is about to do the same. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others. He can do. So all the blessed people just shout at your boy. If he ever made a way out of no way, make some noise. If he's ever made rivers in the desert, make noise. If he's ever made armies out of your bones, make some noise. If he's ever done anything for you, make some noise. Why? Because if he's doing it for them, he can most definitely do it for you. You should have been there when they were at their lowest. Do me a favor. Just tell your neighbors, I'm due. I'm due. I've been, I'm, I'm not leaving here pregnant. I, I'm going to have this baby if it comes hell to high water. That person you next to, you should have been there when they were thinking about committing suicide. You should have been there when they took the bottle of pills. You should have been there when they thought about cutting their wrists. They are not here today because nothing went wrong. They are here today because they survived the ground time. They are here today because they are in the three and a half inch a day season. I don't know who this is for, but God told me to tell Telling you that you are like the bamboo you can bend but you will not break you have a power that most people don't have you are stronger than you think and God is about to use you listen listen he's about to use you listen to help somebody else the bamboo doesn't get to serve itself the bamboo don't get to walk around talking about, I'm bamboo. I'm bamboo. Boo, I'm bam. I'm, I'm strong. I'm, I'm tough. No, the bamboo has to get strong for somebody to cut on it. The bamboo has to be strong just so somebody can walk on it. Oh, preach, man. The bamboo has to be strong enough just for somebody to sit on it. You got to understand that a part of your destiny is them walking over you and them cutting on you and them sitting stuff on you and them lying on you and them overlooking you so that God can show. Yes. So that God can show the world what he can do with the thing that won't quit. Everybody in here has a testimony. Oh, you've been through something. You might not want nobody to know about it. You might be trying to hide it so you can act all good and perfect for us, but you're a mess. Matter of fact, just look at your name and say, I know you're a mess. You ain't got to tell me. I know you're a mess because I'm one too. 
I know you're a mess. The reason I know you're a mess is because I know what a mess look like. I'm a mess. I'm a mess, but I'm saved by grace. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? I'm a mess, but I still got the job that I didn't qualify for. I'm a mess, but they still going to promote me. I'm a mess. I don't know who this is for, but some of y'all just started a job. You're going to be promoted faster than the people who were there when you got there. I don't know who that's for, but he just told me to tell you. Today's message on this day after Christmas it's for anybody who has ever, listen, been discouraged in the process. This message is for people who tired of waiting. Oh, God. This message is for people like, they don't even see what I've been doing for them. Because <laughs> if, I, if I was really who they think I am, everybody would know their business. If I, if I could, I mean, I could if I want to. You, you don't even have any idea how I protected you. How many of y'all have been saying that they have no idea the kind of evil I could really be and the kind of stuff I can really think of? But I said, you know what? It ain't worth it. My brother. I want to tell you, be not weary. Aaron, be not weary in your well-doing. Sometimes it takes five to seven years for the roost to start to show. And, and, and the reason why I want to tell you about this is because, see, the roots of a plant called the morning glory and the roots of a bamboo tree, sometimes you'll get frustrated because, see, the morning glory grows 12 inches a season. The bamboo almost takes 12 years to grow at all. And sometimes you will be upset because you will be looking at a morning glory season. But you have a bamboo anointing. And you'll be upset because you're not growing as fast as the morning glory. But the problem with the morning glory is it dies in the first freeze. And the reason why God has elongated your process is because he needs you strong enough to survive a season. He needs you strong enough to survive a cutting. He needs you strong enough to survive a stumping. He needs you strong enough because what's coming in your life, you're going to be walked all over and you cannot look like what you've been through. You're going to have to be strong. Somebody say, Lord, make me strong. Who am I preaching to in this place? Who am I preaching to online? Just because you don't see success doesn't mean God isn't performing. Stop measuring your ministry to somebody else's ministry. Stop thinking because their house is bigger than yours, then that must mean they're blessed. You could be in the house you can afford. They can be in one they're struggling to stay in. Stop thinking that because they have a sub-zero refrigerator and you got one from Best Buy that they are any blessed because yours is full of meat and theirs is empty. Sub-zero. Sub -zero. <laughs> that means you've been blessed. Just because you don't see the difference in your spouse right now don't mean God ain't working on them. Just because your child is it making straight A's yet doesn't mean God isn't working on them. Just because you haven't gotten the job of your dream yet doesn't mean that God isn't working on it. Just because your account isn't overflowing with money doesn't mean that God hasn't already blessed you, but you cannot be weary. I want to preach to somebody today because this verse isn't a part of the story of a king. So we overlook it. This story ain't attached to David's legacy as the king of Judah and Israel. So we just skip over it because it's not in the story. So it's just one of those that we quote, be not weary and well doing for we'll reap a harvest if you faint not. But if you don't exegete this text, if you don't extrapolate the truth from this text, you will be quoting power while being powerless. And I'm going to show you 
how to wear the devil out with this, this verse right here. How many of y'all want to smack the devil upside the head with this verse? Every time he messes with you, I wanted you to take Galatians 6 and smack him upside the head with it. And I'm getting ready to give you the ability to do it. Watch this. When I look at it, I see seven key words. I want you to write these words down. I'm going to tell you what they mean in the Greek, and I'm going to tell you how to use it in English. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right, here it is. The book of Galatians actually marks the time where Christendom was changing, and there were Jewish Christians who came from Judaism, so they were already in the church. Now, remember, the Bible says there's no more what? Jew or Gentile. So now Gentile Christians are in the church, and y'all know how the super saved folk act like how they act when new people come to church. Right. So y'all know how people who've been in church a long time and, and you remember those days where you couldn't wear no hat in the church and and you couldn't walk across the altar because it was unholy and and you couldn't touch the Lord's supper table. How many of y'all I have got I have seen people lose their life for touching the table that said this doing remembrance of me. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about a day in church where there was a table up front that was made out of the same wood as the chairs in the pulpit. Now, how many of y'all been in church that long? The pews matched the chairs, the chairs matched that, and there was a sign on the wall that talked about how much money was raised in the Sunday school and how much was on the Sunday morning. Who, who am I talking to? Who been out here? I ain't talking about the Lord's Supper that come in a prepackaged cup. I'm talking about when the preacher would stand behind a sheet and wash his hands and you can hear the crackers crackling on his microphone and, and they had real water and real wine. How many of y'all remember that church? This church met people who wore Jordans to church. And so the Stacey Adams crowd, y'all don't remember no Stacey Adams. What's wrong with them, KP? Where they been all their life? Y'all don't know nothing about Stacey Adams? If you don't know nothing about Stacey Adams' patent leather with that gold or silver tip on the front, you ain't been in church long enough. So you got, you got the Stacey Adams crowd with six buttons with a hat to match, with a diamond in the back, sunroof top, digging the scene. And that church met T-shirt wearing Christians. And they thought because they had suits, they was better than the people with the T-shirts. And God is like, uh, first of all, I judge not the countenance of a man. I judge a man or a woman by his. So sometimes you can have Christians that have on more than they have in them. And now there's a collision in the church with empty people trying to be full and full people who don't recognize they're empty. And there was a collision in the church and Paul steps up to write this book and says, no, God didn't build the church for us to be splintered. There is no Greek or Jew. In other words, listen this is actually the Bible's attempt at telling us that racism is wrong. Oh, y'all ain't here with me today. He's actually dealing with racism in the church. And let me tell you something. I don't know whether you know it or not, but racism is still in the body of Christ. And he says, no, I want to build a church where a mother can sit next to a teenager. And I want to build a church where a person can be at the club Saturday and still come to the altar on Sunday and not be judged by the people who don't go to the club but hold grudges. Huh? Y'all ain't going to say amen. Just say ouch if I'm on your street. And, and so he says, this is a problem. And, and he says... Uh, you're going to have to deal with these people and, and you're going to have people in your life they're not going to change. You're going to have people in your life that they're going to judge you for everything. You're going to have people in your life who won't know your history but always think they know your destiny. You're going to have people who met you halfway through the journey and going to have something to say. You're going to meet people who are going to think this and think that and he says I'm going to need you to treat those people right and then I know you're going to say God it's hard to treat people who treat me wrong right. He's going to say but be not weary. 
when you're doing well. Be not weary. Everybody repeat after me. Be not weary. Be not weary is a compound word in Kael. It's the word when it, it, it means this, when you combine it, it is, it is the form uh, of a word that talks about destruction. So what he's saying is, is when you combine them, he's saying, don't give in to destruction. Don't give in. When, when you build a building up, it's called construction. When you tear it down, it's called destruction. In other words, he's saying, don't you get tired when people try to tear you down. Don't get tired when the enemy is trying to bring your confidence down low. Don't get tired. I know you didn't deserve it. I know you didn't have it coming. I know that you have given your best, but you're going to mess around and miss the miracle because my response to your circumstance and what you are going through and what you're fighting, sir, is be not weary. I need everybody here to shout, be not weary. Say it again, be not weary. Paul says, I command you not to surrender. I, I highly suggest that you do not give up. I have to insist that you don't surrender. I don't care how hard it was. I don't care how broken hearted you are. I don't care what they said. I don't care how low they went. I don't care how they ignored you. I don't care how they walked out on you. My word to you is be not weary. Everybody shall be not weary. I don't care. Guess is God. So I don't. I am not concerned with the situation. I am concerned about your response. And my word to you is: be not weary when you are in a destructive situation. You have to continue. Second point: to do well. Be not weary in what? Well doing. The word well is the word kalos, which means good, but it is rather translated useful. Doing is from the Greek word poio, watch this, which means a type of activity. In other words, the devil wants you to get tired of doing the right thing. He wants you to get tired of doing the right thing. I'm about to, I don't, I, I don't care if y'all go to sleep now, it's just me and the Lord. This is what he says. I, I want you to understand because I'm watching you all right now and I promise you I could, I could show somebody. Come here, sir. I want you to come here real quick because they don't, they're going to think I made this up. Uh, but I want you to read it because I've been preaching a long time. I want you to read these words right here in yellow. In other words, the devil wants you to get tired of doing the right thing. Read this in red. Fatigue is attracted to right. Stay up all night in the club, almost sleep after 22 minutes of a sermon. You may have a seat, sir. So that way you won't think I made it up. I've been preaching long enough to know that by the time I got 22 minutes in the sermon, you were going to be asleep. But when you go to the club, ain't nobody got to keep you up. Why? Because fatigue is always attracted to the thing that's going to make you grow. You always get tired in a sermon. You always get tired in the Bible. You always get tired in the Word. But when it's time to turn up, encore. Ah, I'm preaching right now. I hope you mad and it's in my notes so you don't think I'm making it up right now. I can't tell you how many people come to church and get sleepy halfway through the sermon, but they can go everywhere else and stay woke. Why? Because fatigue is always attached to the thing that's going to help you. So you sleep through the help and shout through the hurt. This is when you need to be woke. This is when you need to be woke. But here's what I understand. People don't prepare for church like they prepare for everything else. When they know they're going to be out all night, they take a nap. They get some sleep. They get some pregame so they don't have to spend all their money when they get to the club. But they come to church off of two hours of sleep. No wonder you can't stay up. Preach, Keon. I think I will. But let me tell you something, baby, when you're pregnant and you do, you got to get some rest. When you are doing, you about to give birth to something, you got to rest for the process. I don't want you coming to church tired. I need you to come here fired up because there is something that's going to be said in this room that's going to take your life to the next level. Be not weary in well-doing. You watched all a Kevin Hart series in the same day. The TV had to ask you, was you sleep? And you were still up on your fifth episode. But we get into the house of the Lord. Because fatigue is always attached to your help. Now I'm preaching. Oh, Keon, you just said a word. Say it, boy. I, will. I think I will. I'll say it again. 
Fatigue always comes when you're close to breakthrough. Here you are asleep in the presence of God, shouting in the presence of Satan. New Year's, ain't nobody going to be asleep at midnight. This time tomorrow, you're going to be at work, sleepy again. <laughs> right tomorrow. As soon as work over, you're going to get a bolt of energy. As soon as you get back to your kids, you're going to be tired again. I want you to, you, you, you're laughing at me, but I want you to start realizing when you get tired. It is always when you need to be helpful. Fatigue is always attached to the thing you were created to hear or do. But you got to be not weary. This ain't the time to get weary right now. This sermon is almost over. This just ain't the time to get weary. If you, you got to say something to yourself, you got to wake yourself up because I'm telling you right now, if you use this scripture correctly, you will be able to get the devil off of you. I want you to write this scripture down when you get home and read it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 9. I want you to read this when you get home. David was playing the harp for Saul. And the Bible says that Saul was there with his spear in his hand. And then an evil spirit came from the Lord upon Saul. And Saul picked up a javelin and he threw it at David. And the Bible says that David dodged the spear and it went into the wall and the wall held it. In other words, this man was trying to kill the man that God used to help him. David is playing the harp. Saul throws a spear he jumps out of the way and goes back to doing his job. You know, I thought about telling some of you that when the enemy is throwing things at you, it's not the time to quit, dodge it, and keep playing. The next time I sit, you know, because most times when something is thrown at us that we don't want, we quit. I give up. I'm tired of doing this. I've been giving it all I got. See, that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to quit from one spear. David says, I am called to play this harp, and I'm going to play it until I die. So guess what? You throw the harp, I'm going to dodge it, I'm going to keep playing. you got to have a life that you stop quitting when you're thrown at, and you just dodge it and keep doing the job. That's what he did. He stopped. You've got to dodge the spear. Everybody say, dodge the spear. Say it again, dodge the spear. And I am telling you, that you cannot be weary in your well-doing. Why? Because there is something coming. What's coming? Due season. Be not weary in well-doing for due season. Due season, kairos, idios, means its own. Kairos means a set time. That means that your life has its own season. Everybody say, my life has its own season. <laughs> Sir, you might be a millionaire at 30. Ma'am, you might not get there until you're 40, but just because God did it for him at 30 and does it for you at 40 doesn't mean he's late. It just means that his life had a set time and so does yours. And you got to stop being frustrated with people who get there before you because they could be the morning glory. You could be the bamboo. Dogs have babies every year. It takes an elephant two years to have one. Why? Because when you stay pregnant for a long time, it means the baby's going to be big. And the Bible lets us know that we cannot be weary in what? Well-doing. It, it is said in an African proverb, when, a, when, a, when an animal, a dog has a baby, all you hear is a, is a sound. But, but when, when an elephant has a baby, the earth shakes. I want you to think about a giraffe having a baby and that baby hitting the ground. Boom! There is an earth-shattering thing. The, the thing that's in you uh, that's getting ready to come out, when you drop it, the earth will shake. When you drop it, things will change. You, you got to stop wanting your life to be on this, I'm getting blessed every other weekend. I'm getting blessed every other season. Why? Because small things don't take long to germinate. But when God has something big inside of you, you might not give birth in 19. You may not give birth in 2020. You might not have given birth in 2021. But when you give birth in 2022, God going to put you in a situation like he did Joseph's mother because Leah had baby after baby after baby after baby after 
after baby. And you know what? Rachel only had one, but that one, his name was Joseph. And the Bible lets us know that one Joseph is worth two Rubians, three Levites, seven Simeons. Why? Because God's going to give you one thing that's worth more than all their things. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody who is patient enough for God to give you one big thing that will cancel your weight. How many of y'all know something big is inside of you? This sermon ain't for everybody. This sermon is only for the people who got big stuff in them. For all of y'all who want to come by night blessing, you want manna from heaven every day, you want water out of every rock, this ain't your sermon. But for people who've been in the valley of the shadow of death, for people who have walked in the valley of dry bones, for people who have been distressed and depressed and frustrated and angry and have been sick and diagnosed and all of that day, that weight on the Lord shall renew their strength. And you're getting ready to mount up with wings like eagles and don't confuse my wings with your wings because chickens have wings too but they cannot fly don't look at somebody's wings and say I want those wings because one wing is set for the air the other is set for the ground you can get wings and still not take flight and I have never and I mean never seen an eagle having a conversation with a chicken about how his day is going if you go online right now, you can find eagles that walk. You know why? Because they hang out with chickens. You will learn the flight pattern of the people you surround yourself with. And if you keep walking with walkers, you're going to stay on the ground. God, take the walkers out of my life and give me some soarers. Do I have any eagles in this place? I don't want my flight itinerary filled out by somebody who has never left the ground. Give me somebody who has the faith to fly. Ask your neighbor, do you have the faith to fly? What they say. If they ain't saying nothing to you, tell them, get off my room and go sit in the back. There's three seats back there. You can go sit in. Because over the next 30 seconds, I'm about to turn my whole room into a praise section. If you don't want to praise, get off of my room. I'm looking for glory on this room. I'm looking for growth on this room. Look down your room. If your neighbor ain't talking to you yet, say, please, get off my room. Get off. Get off. Somebody say, my season. My season. Am I helping you say something? Yeah. My, season. my season. All of our children didn't start walking on the same day. Right. True. I can't tell you how many parents do their children a disservice by measuring them against somebody else's child. Mine, mine ain't walking yet. Yours walking. And you know what? Sometimes one might start talking before the other one. One might start walking before the other. It doesn't mean that one something is wrong with one child because they didn't do it in the same time frame as another. Some children are potty trained early. Some take a little bit late. Why? Because everything has a set season. And you got to learn to be patient with yours. Stop trying to be somebody else. I'd rather die 100% me than half of you. you got to wait the Lord. Everybody say, I got a set season. Some people get rich when they're 20. Something like Mark Zuckerberg and some of them don't become billionaires until they're 50. Something like Warren Buffett. And you can't think that God is not going to do it for you because it didn't happen in the same time frame as somebody else. Don't be weary! Yours is going to grow too. Yours is going to blow up too. The idea is going to come to you too if you are patient enough to wait on your set Season. Your job is not to grow the seed. Your job is to not get weary so that you don't derail your destiny. How many of y'all almost gave up? Be honest. I know this message is for you because the end of this year is here and you're like, it ain't happening yet, so I'm done. But do you know that there is enough time left in this year for God to still make this the best year in your life? How many of y'all believe that? If you believe that, make some noise in this place. Another scripture I want you to read when you get home. And don't be just writing it down. Y'all be looking down like you really don't read it. Can you read it? <laughs> and then get home and don't read it. Daniel chapter 9. I want you to read the whole chapter. Okay? The Bible says that Daniel prayed to the Lord. And then the Bible goes on to say that the Lord didn't answer Daniel for 21 days. 
21 days. And he was desperate. 21 days. The Lord didn't say nothing. Then when you finish reading chapter 9, go read chapter 10. Because he prayed again. She's like, Rev, that's too much homework. Just, right. just, listen, just, just read it. I'm going to help you. Because when you get to chapter 10, Daniel prayed again. And the Bible says, and he answered him the same day. Some prayers he don't answer for 21 days. But some prayers he answers the same day. And you won't know which one is which if you're not praying. Amen. There are something that God told me to tell you that he's about to take the weight off of it and give it to you the day you ask for it. Woo! I wasn't talking to sleepy people. Y'all be shouting all around here. I said, God said he's about to take the weight off of the thing that you asked for. I'm going to talk to y'all at home. God is about to take the weight off of what you have been praying for. If you pray for it today, he's going to give it to you today. If you pray for it tomorrow, you're going to get it tomorrow. But I have made up in my mind that I'm going to ask for it all today. This is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Stand to your feet. I want to minister to you before I let you go. It don't always happen as fast as you want it to, Cole. It don't always happen as fast as you want it to. I know you got something, you and your wife, you've been praying for it and praying for it and praying for it. You haven't told me what it is, but it ain't going to happen as fast as you want it to because it's got to be stronger than the time frame you're giving it to grow. Because you don't know what weight God is going to put on it. So, so only God knows that. So he said, I'm not making you wait because I'm selfish. I'm making you wait because it's going to have to hold weight. Somebody say, I receive it. I receive it. Because we always shout about the woman with the issue of blood and how she touched the hem of his garment and, and he was made whole. But don't nobody talk about the fact she had to wait 12 years to get it. 12 years of a menstrual cycle. 12 years of your kind of cramps. 12 years. Everybody can't like the same. Some of y'all can have a menstrual cycle and go play basketball. Some of y'all got to take a vacation five days a month. Twelve years. Oh, and by the way, every doctor she went to let her down. So it wasn't twelve years of inactivity. She was trying. She went to MD Anderson. She went to Methodist. They couldn't do nothing. She went to urgent care. They couldn't do nothing. It took her 12 years to get to her answer. Bamboo. She didn't know her story was going to be in the Bible. She didn't know. Mark chapter 9. Oh God, this man is blind. Is he blind? Because they believed that blindness was a result of parents' sin. He said, is he blind because of his mother sin, his father sin? God said, no, no, no. He's blind. For the sake of the gospel. Sometimes God will make you wait for him. So that he can use your situation as a testimony. And I'm telling you right now, hear me, Holy Ghost. Some of y'all been through hell and high water, but let me tell you, the way you're going to come out of this thing, they're going to write about it. Oh, God. Oprah going to have to cover this testimony. Some of y'all going to sit on Dr. Spill's couch after y'all finish with it. It's, it's a lot right now, but you don't understand there was a best-selling novel coming out of your situation. I know you didn't want to be a single mama, but when you are being interviewed all over the world for how to raise them by yourself, I know you didn't want to lose your job, but one day you're going to have to write a book on how you went from the hood to doing good. There's a whole lot that's getting ready to come out of what you're in, but you gotta be not weary. Lazarus, don't you get upset because it took me four days to show up for you. And I showed up the same thing for somebody else because let me tell you, when you're dead, it don't matter. When I show up, it's always on time. Don't judge your season off of somebody else's season. 
Oh, I did that. I did that. I've been there. I bought that ticket. I bought that T-shirt. Sitting here wondering, why isn't our church growing like this church? And why isn't our church doing that? And then all of a sudden, I stepped in my process and Because <clears throat> you imagine, the people were following me as a pastor. We were in a school still after five years. You can hear the you must be still in the money. You still in the money. You're still in the school after five years. Look at all that. Still in the school after five years. They've been giving and giving. You remember that, Elliot? They're still in the school for five years. They didn't know we was going to buy million dollar buildings cash. <laughs> they, they, right, right now, at the North Campus, there is eight million dollars worth of construction going on, and five million came out of our pocket. So, so while they are talking about you, I just want you to let the enemy know, I ain't spending now because I'm saved, but I ain't spending now because I'm saved. I ain't shopping now because I'm saved, because when I come out, I'm going to hit them in the head. I'm coming out, I'm buying my cars cash, I'm buying my house cash, I ain't putting no clothes on the credit card. When I come out, I'm coming out hard. Somebody say it's my season. Be not weary in well-doing, for you real reap a harvest. In due season. If you don't act a fool, yeah. I'm paraphrasing. If you faint not, you will reap a harvest if you don't respond to that DM. You will reap a harvest if you don't put your daddy on front street because of what he didn't do for you. You will reap a harvest if you co-parent and stop hating. You will reap a harvest if you stop lying to make yourself look better. You will reap a harvest if you forgive people who misused you. You will reap a harvest if you can muster up enough strength to say I'm sorry even when you were not the one that did wrong. Help us! Help this church on the go. I feel the anointing of God in this place. If you've ever been tempted to faint, I want you to lift your hands. Just, I just want to quit. God says, Sir, listen. I want everybody to stick your hand out like this. The Bible says, if you faint not, in the Greek, it means this. I'm giving you the translation. It means to give up on something that was almost in your grip. It's like, this is my anchor. This is my storm. And I'm right here. And then I faint. Your deliverance is always yep. on the other side of where you gave up. Yep. You are this close. You don't have room to be frustrated when you're this close. You, you can't quit when you this close. You can't loosen your grip when God's about to put it in your hand. And you're well doing for you real reap a harvest don't faint. everybody say God sees me even if they don't God sees you even if they don't recognize you God knows where you are he knows your name he knows what you did he knows what you didn't do and you don't have to spend the rest of your life explaining yourself Quit leaves this building. God, I don't know what they're trusting you for in this season of their life. Maybe a financial harvest. Maybe a breakthrough in their health. Maybe a restoration in their relationship. Hmm. 
maybe their harvest has taken longer than they anticipated. But I come to speak that the spirit of quit would die. That they will be patient enough until it is their due season. Develop us today that we can have the comprehensive strength to not be crushed, to bend and not to break. This is the day that everything changes. This is the day where the miracle has our name on it. This is the day that the touch of God comes on our life. In the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, I want you to worship God like it's already done. Hey, what's up, family? Listen, I enjoyed the word today. I know you did as well. Hey, if you want to take part in what we're doing here, we have some numbers going to come across the screen. If you want to give to us, hit the number on the screen. If you want to join, be a part of what we're doing here, hit the number on the screen. And remember, share, send this message to someone. Someone needs to hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for the word that was given. We pray that someone's heart was touched and someone's mind was changed. We love you, God. All these blessings we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. Hey, remember, we love you here at the Lighthouse Church. Nothing you can do about it. See you soon. going on is PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you. And that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor. And PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem where we all come to grow together. And it is exclusively for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can't get in. So you better take first movers advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you.